And so all this wealth that's talked about in Revelation 18, I believe a lot of it is consolidated in the oligarchy and the extremely rich people. Now, the first point that you have in this is the first three verses, the proclamation of judgment. So verse number one in Revelation 18, it says, And after these things, I saw another angel. So after these things is after he was told about the judgment on the, uh, the whore that rides the beast, the religious system uh, of, the, of the end times. After that, he says, after these things, I saw another angel. So another comes from a word that means another of the same type. So it's another uh, holy angel of God, different from the other angel that he talked to in chapter 17. So after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. I'm telling you guys, there are things that God has created that we have not seen. And we are just going to be amazed when we see them. Amen? And it, this description of this angel is absolutely incredible. Having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And what seems to happen when you read through the book of, of, of the Lord here, the Word of God, is that people that spend time with God, they get this glow upon them. Uh, it, 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 it's uh, amazing, this transformation that takes place. And so people that come from heaven to earth, they're usually uh, described as, as having you know, great glory or shy, bright and shiny. Uh, when we think about the angels who are at the tomb when J at Jesus' resurrection, and it talks about the brightness of their garment, uh, why is that? It, it, it's because of coming from heaven. It's because of the glory of God. They're reflecting that glory. And I think about uh, my daughter. You can think about your loved ones that have gone on, that have been spending all this time in front of God, at the throne of God, and when you see them, how the glory of God will just, you know, shine forth from them. Amen? Uh, it's just an incredible thought of, of the transformation uh, that these people uh, that we know and love, and we'll see again someday, if they were saved and knew Christ as their Savior, we're going to see them again. Amen? And that's the hope that we have. And, and uh, they'll be shining uh, with this glory. I also like how it refers to these angels uh, at the tomb as two young men. They, man, people don't age in heaven, amen? They stay young forever. And that's a glorious thought, especially, you know, as I'm getting older now. Uh, to some people, I'm still fairly young, 63. To other folks, the, the teen class, I'm ancient. I'm old. <laughs> I showed them my graduation picture this morning, and they were like, wow. And they were trying to keep from laughing. <laughs> and again, and I'm like, well, you're going to get there too, because it's the path we all, we all walk, amen? And uh, I used to tease Don Neely about being an old man. And, and he used to say to me, he said, well, at least I made it this long. You don't know if you're going to make it that long. He didn't know he was a prophet. I might not make it as old as he was, but I'm trusting God. You know, we'll see what happens. Trust God. Uh, if not, I'll just be forever young in heaven. Amen? And uh, so here is this angel having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice. And so this is like really loud, a real strong. I mean, nobody's mistaken what this angel is saying. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon uh, the Great is fallen. Now before, she was called uh, Mystery Babylon the Great, because it was talking about her, the religious system. But now it's not talking about the religious system no more. It's just simply saying, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. And I, I, I might be, I'm not sure the exact chapter, maybe Revelation 14, where it talks about Babylon is fallen, has fallen. But here we're told Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become, so it wasn't this, but it became this, the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of, of every unclean and hateful bird. 
Now, in just a moment, we're just going to see if the Scripture gives us any hints as to this Babylon. Uh, some hold that, that it's, uh, it's America, which is w one of my opinions, but not my strongest opinion. And when I think about America, I think about America didn't start out as this, but America has become this. Amen? America is going to get worse. Uh, we've got a judgment of God coming our way. There is no escape in it. Uh, if we're not the Babylon of Scripture, we've got a major judgment coming to us. Uh, it may happen before the rapture. I don't know, because Christians can blame themselves for a lot of things that have happened. But here it says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become. So it wasn't something, but it became this, the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. That means this Babylon is demonically motivated and possessed. It's controlled by the demonic realm. We discussed this with the men uh, yesterday, that we are living in a real spiritual warfare with an unseen realm. And it is real. And it is powerful. And we need to be walking with the Lord if we expect to exercise victory and authority over these wicked things. Amen? Uh, most of Christians are, are oblivious, and the others go way off the deep end with it. But we've got to realize that this is a real thing. Amen? And some of your problems may be just that. You need to recognize it. And you need to uh, pay attention to Scripture. Pay attention to what's going on. Pay attention to what you're allowing uh, to happen in your life. Because what you allow happening to, in your life, you can invite uh, ungodliness, these evil spirits in. Amen? If you're sitting there at home watching these ungodly horror movies and hack movies and all this garbage, don't be surprised if you start uh, experiencing uh, demonic manifestations in your home. Amen? Because you have invite them in. Uh, you told them that it's all right to be there. And uh, even with things that you may think is harmless, like Harry Potter. Harry Potter is not harmless. Harry Potter is a, a beginner's guide to witchcraft. And... Uh, it's evil, and it's ungodly. God said to abstain from all appearances of evil, but yet we're Christians you know, that, that live with our, our heads in the ground or somewhere. We're not paying attention to what's going on. And, and we get involved in all this garbage that we don't need to be involved with. And uh, so here's this habitation of devils and a hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now notice the verse 3, for all nations, all nations, every nation that exists at that time, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Wow. These people are being made rich that are willing to cooperate with the beast system, willing to cooperate with the Antichrist. They are going to be made very wealthy. And, uh, but this is a global thing. It has a global effect. All right, so, so, so who is the, this Babylon? And, and does the Scripture give us any, any hints to the possibility? Now, I want to say right up front, nobody can say 100% specific, this is what it is. But we do have some hints to kind of guide us. First of all, in Revelation chapter 18, it speaks of that great city. Look at verse, verse number 10. Look at what the Word of God says there. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Now, let me get sidetracked for just a second here because i got to address this. One thing that this isn't and never was was the World Trade Centers. All right? I, when they went down, I don't know, Christians were coming up to me. Oh, brother, it's Revelation 18. And I, no, it's not. You're not in the tribulation period. In fact, this is towards the end of the tribulation period when this happens. That, you know, hey, that didn't, uh, this has nothing to do with the World Trade Centers coming down. That's a whole nother ball of wax. That's a whole nother ball game. 
I won't open that can of worms this morning because that runs a lot deeper than what meets the eye. All right? Uh, look at verse number 16. Verse number 16. And saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. That great city. All right? So he's talking about a specific city. That great city, that mighty city. Look at verses 18 through 19. And cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. Verse number 21, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. So there you have several specific references to a great city, one reference to a mighty city. So it has to be not just a system, but a real place. Kind of like, I've heard Rari say this before, it's kind of like Wall Street. Wall Street is a place and a system. So maybe it can still be a system, but it specifically has to be a place. It's, the great, it's a great city, amen? Um, look at uh, Isaiah chapter 13. And one of the problems that, that people have uh, with Babylon is the fact that in Jeremiah uh, and Isaiah, it talks about the destruction of Babylon, the complete annihilation of Babylon. And therefore, they feel like, well, uh, Babylon will not return. It, it, it can never be rebuilt. Be rebuilt. Uh, Schofield, in his study Bible, he, re he reflects that opinion that you know, Babylon will never be rebuilt. Rebuilt, But Larkin, in his commentary on Revelation, he believes that Babylon will be rebuilt. Now, those are old guys, and they're contemporaries with each other back in the day, you know, over 100 years ago. In fact, it's funny because, uh, you know, Larkin talks about the mark of the beast, and he calls it the brand of hell that will be branded upon your hand or your forehead. Well, he didn't know about modern technology that now is all he had to do is inject a chip that can say everything about you. And it would be nothing to just put it in your hand there or in the forehead. Elon Musk is working on a chip now that he wants to be able to be put in the brain so that you can uh, access the internet and all that with just thinking about it. It's absolutely incredible. And I may have told you this. Uh, several years back, there was a program that was on uh, television, and that's exactly what it's about. It's about this guy. He, he solved a lot of uh, international mystery cases. You know, Sherlock, not Sherlock Holmes, but like, a, uh, like a, uh, a James Bond type characters. And he had this chip that was in his head, and it allowed him to access information. It only ran one season. And I found out why, because they were letting too much out of the bag with the artificial intelligence. Uh, like the Billy Crone always says, what, what was that? <laughs> was it? Wow. Hey, man, brother, you're doing good. <laughs> you, made, what did, you, know, you made me forget. Oh, Billy Crone always said that uh, wherever we're at, that we know that we're at right now in technology, uh, the government is 50 years ahead of that. Amen? And so, I mean, there's no telling what, what they can do. But pay attention to different things that you see in commercials and on TV because they're, they're arrogant enough to tip you off a little bit. All right? So, uh, so anyway, uh, this Babylon that Isaiah talks about and its judgment and destruction, Notice what it says in Isaiah 13 and verse number 6. He says, How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. 
Now, here's a key phrase here that tips you off. How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. That's talking about the tribulation period. The day of the Lord brings you into the, the tribulation period, goes right on through the millennial kingdom. So he's talking about while Babylon would suffer a judgment in its day, it would also su suffer a future devastation in which nobody would ever inhabit it ever again. That has never happened to the Babylon that exists today. In fact, Saddam Hussein was working on it, building palaces and rebuilding the structures, and, and millions and millions of dollars have been spent on rebuilding that old Babylon. And even uh, now, the only thing that has really slowed it down, not so much the death of Saddam Hussein, uh, but the pandemic kind of interfered with things a little bit. But they're working on it, amen? And the, and the best embassy that the Americans have is in Baghdad. It's self-sustaining. I told you this already. It's a self-sustaining embassy. And Baghdad is still consider, considered ancient, ancient Babylon. Might not be the exact city of Babylon, but it's within the bounds of Babylon as a nation. And uh, no matter what happens outside of that embassy, doesn't matter. Everybody inside the embassy would be safe. That, that embassy is self-sustaining. They would have nothing to worry about. What I find interesting about them bragging about that is that's the same thing Nebuchadnezzar and his descendants bragged about. Oh, our walls are impregnable. They'll never get in here. And they had these great big high walls and went all around the city. And then if you got past that set of walls, there was another set of walls. The mistake that they made is they trailed water in through uh, from the Euphrates that would come in under the old city of Babylon, and they would get their water supply from it. And that was their mistake, because the Assyrians allowed the, uh, the, the Medes and the Persians, some, they blocked off the water so that the water would recede down, and when it did, they came in and said, here we are, surprise. <laughs> and they took, they took the city of Babylon, they took it in one day, but it was never destroyed. In fact, at the time of Christ, there was still a lot of Jews living there in that Babylon. And uh, so there's always been somebody living there. So it's never been destroyed like it's been prophesied, which means that it has to happen in a, a future sense. Uh, verse number 9 says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel with, uh, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. All right, um, look down, drop down to verses 19 and, and 20. Uh, there, the Word of God tells us in verses 19 and 20, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. All right, here's the problem. That never happened. So it has to happen sometime in the future. And it would have to happen to a rebuilt Babylon. Amen? Which with modern technology wouldn't take all that much. It wouldn't take all that much time. And Another thing about this, about this Babylon, if it be a rebuilt Babylon, uh, is simply this, is that it, when you read Revelation chapter 18, a, a lot of money is being made through transfer of trade coming in and out. And the way Babylon is situated in the Middle East, it's a key passageway to everything to the, to the west and everything to the east and to the north. Amen? And also, you could argue to the south. But, of course, they will run into Israel down there, who at that time is going to be very strong and independent and on their way right now to be in that. So, so it's a key location for trade. So there's a good argument that, could be, that can be made that Babylon is, is literal. And every city in the scriptural, scripture has always been a literal city. And the two most mentioned cities in the Bible are Israel's mentioned the most, or Jerusalem is mentioned the most, followed by Babylon, mentioned over 200 some times. So why would all of a sudden just this one Babylon just be something else? 
you know, New York City or, or some other place in the world. Why, why would it be that when all the other times they're literal places? And so I, I kind of lean toward that. I kind of lean toward that, that someday that Babylon uh, will be rebuilt and will be usable and the Antichrist is going to be able to use it for his purposes. All right, I knew I wasn't going to get through this chapter, but let me just hit these two verses here. Uh, the next point is the, is the admonition of God's people. All right, the admonition of God's people, verses 4 and 5 in Revelation chapter 9. Uh, excuse me, 18. Revelation 18, uh, looking at verses 4 and 5. Uh, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. So God is pleading with his people. So in the tribulation period, who will be his people? Well, whoever gets saved during the tribulation, uh, but for sure, uh, the Jews are still the people of God. Um, for people that think that this Babylon uh, is New York City, you still have close to 6 million Jews living in New York City. Half the population of Israel, uh, or not half, but the same amount of the population in Israel lives in New York City. And so if it would be that, then God's saying, hey, come out of her, my people. And he gives two reasons why. Two reasons why you need to come out of her. That you be not partaker of her sins. Amen? Her sins have reached the heavens. It's going to be time to judge her. Verse 5 says, For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. So God is going to judge sin. And he says, come on out of her, or else you're going to feel the wrath of that. You're going to get part of that. Amen? And, uh, you know, that's a very real thing. Sin, sin is corruptible. Uh, people are so deceived by sin. In fact, the Bible refers to it as the deceitfulness of sin. Because some reason we feel like we can play with it and get away with it. And you can't do that. You know, it takes one rotten apple, right? That's all it takes. And then the whole, the whole bushel of apples is no good. And yet, we put ourselves in amongst these other rotten apples and think that somehow we're not going to be affected by it. But even in the Old Testament, it talks about, you know, something holy Bumping into something unholy doesn't make it holy, but something unholy bumping into something holy makes what's unholy unclean. And yet, as Christians, we don't think about this. We just say, ah, we can do whatever we want. No, you can't do whatever you want. There's ramifications. There's judgments for sins. And should God start uh, pouring out His wrath upon America, we're going to feel it just like everybody else. The economy collapses, you're going to feel it. Uh, the only difference is that we have God to rely on to take care of us, to get us through. Amen? Uh, but, uh, I'm telling you, we deserve judgment. I don't want us to be judged, but we deserve it. I mean, we have become so ungodly and wicked. A second reason he tells his people to come out of there in verse 4, he says, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. You receive not of her plagues. Think about, uh, you know, in Genesis 19 and when the angels have got to get uh, Lot out of Sodom because they're going to judge Sodom. And uh, he, he stays there, they're going to get, they're going to feel the effects of that. In fact, uh, Lot had family members that laughed at him, they wouldn't, they wouldn't leave, and what happened? They were destroyed with the city. Uh, what about Lot's wife? Jesus says, remember Lot's wife. Why do we need to remember Lot's wife? Because she was told not to look back, but what did she do? She looked back and was turned into a pillow of salt. The looking back didn't reflect, she's looking back because she knows there's destruction and, and in fear just looks back to see the destruction. She looked back because her heart longed to be there. What I find with a lot of Christians today is they keep looking back to the world, not as a remember a remembrance of the rock from which they were hewn, from what they were saved from and delivered from, but they look back with a heart longing to be there. That's a sad, that's a sad thing. It's a sad state of affairs that we find ourselves uh, living in. 
And so the admonition to God's people, come, come out of her, my people. Um, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're either a citizen of Babylon or a citizen of heaven. If you're a citizen of heaven living in Babylon, then here's God's call in verse 4, or hear God's call in verse 4, come out of her, my people. Amen? Amen. All right, so that's what God desires. Now, what I want to look at, at next week, just to want to go back and, and, and cover some things, uh, um, the world's merchandise will be, uh, the world's merchants will become rich through this system. Uh, we'll look at that. Uh, well, let's just go look at that right now since I'm looking at it. Let's just get through that so we'll have less to cover next week. All right, uh, in uh, uh, verse number three, the world's merchants will become rich through this system. Uh, Revelation 18.3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth were waxed rich. They grew and were made rich through the abundance of her delicacies. All right, uh, another thing, the systems will produce luxury and enable an opulent, opulent lifestyle. Verse number seven, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I should a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. See the arrogance, the opulence, being made rich. I'm not going to see no sorrow. Nothing's going to happen to me. Americans are like that. Oh, we don't have nothing to worry about. Nothing's going to happen to us. You know, China's over there wheeling, dealing with uh, Saudi Arabia, and if they can work out a deal where the dollar is no longer the petrodollar, is no longer the U.S. dollar, we are all in serious trouble economically. I'm going to tell you, this stuff is at our, is at our doorstep. Uh, it will handsomely reward the rulers who cooperate with it. Verse number 9 uh, tells us, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. And so the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her. So uh, the system will produce luxury, enable an opulent lifestyle, that it will handsomely reward the rulers who cooperate with it. Uh, Cindy, don't sit down if you can. I'm just going to say one more thing, and then we're going into the invitation. Okay? Sit, sit at the piano. There you go. Yeah. I didn't want to make you have to get up and down. I see you walked out, so I, I extended the message a little. Well, when you only got one piano player, <laughs> you got to do what works, amen. All right, so, so and then the last thing, uh, it will produce mountains of expensive goods. This is what this economic Babylonian system is going to produce, mountains of, uh, of wealth. Verse number 12 uh, tells us, um, verse number 12 tells us, uh, and the, merchant, and the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all fine wood, which is woods that have fragrance like cypress, and all manner of vessels of ivory, all manner of vessels of most precious wood and, bra and of brass and iron and marble. And we'll get into that more as we go through this eight, chapter 18. But this is what that system is going to produce. Amen? And it's going to be luring and very tempting to get people in. But you know what it's going to cost you to be involved in that system? Only your eternal soul. You'll have to take the mark of the beast or else you cannot buy or sell. Wow. Wow. But you have a choice to make right now, long before the tribulation even starts. Will I serve Christ? As a believer, will I serve Christ or will I coast along living in Babylon thinking it's no big deal? You need to serve the Lord while you can. Amen? Only what's done in this life is going to count. Amen? Only what's done for Christ will last. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. Amen? Because you, 
you don't have to worry about the tribulation. You've got to worry about what if I die anytime soon. The Bible says there's one step between me and death. So if I don't know Christ as my Savior, and I'm not talking about, well, yeah, I went to church as a kid. No, I'm talking about there's a time in your life where you realize that you are a sinner deserving to go to a devil's hell. Your sin is separated between you and God. You see that Jesus Christ died on that cross. Why? To pay the penalty for our sin. Amen? He died for the sins of the whole world. And if we'll believe that, the death, burial, and resurrection, and we'll call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God, save me. And guess what? Instantly you're saved. Instantly the Holy Spirit comes to live within your dead spirit. And your spirit becomes alive. You become what the Bible calls born again. But it's a choice that you have to make, and God will never force your hand to make it. He just offers it. Come. Come. Amen. So, Jeremy, if you'll come, lead us in a hymn of invitation, and everybody will stand, and we'll turn uh, in our hymnals to uh, hymn number Hymn number 366, hymn number 366, and as Jeremy is making his way here, I just uh, say, Lord, please bless this invitation and move for your glory and honor. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. Stand together, please. Give me thy heart. Hold open, folks. Come and talk to us.